Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Cecilia Escamilla Greenwald, and I'm your host. We're going to be giving some comments on a film that you're going to be watching later this evening, a very powerful film called Memphis, Montgomery to Memphis. And that film documents the life of Dr. Martin Luther King and his struggle and his lead on the civil rights movement. Joining me in the studio today, I'm very honored to have two very special people here with me. From Hartford, Connecticut, we have the wonderful Reverend Earl W. Lawson. Thank you so much for joining us here, Reverend. It's a privilege. <laughs> we also have here in the studio a longtime resident of Davis, many of you know, Dick Holstock. Thank you so much for joining us this nice evening. Nice to be with you, Sula. Thank you. Um, we're going to be commenting on this very important film that documents the life of Dr. Martin Luther King and this incredible journey that he led during a 12-year period. Um, he was a leader in the civil rights movement. Um, what You were with a group of people, Dick, that took a bus from Davis to Montgomery, Alabama. And I've heard you talk about it before, and it was such a powerful, powerful thing for you. Describe it to me, what it meant to you when you were there, and how you brought that back to the Davis community. Yeah. Um, I guess, first of all, I have to say that we're going to see a lot of footage in that video later on uh, that shows the, what was happening in those days, some of the horrible things that were happening to people uh, in this country. And um, watching television in those days, I don't see how anybody could possibly not want to go and stop this from happening further in our society. Um, so we were very fortunate that uh, Dr. King invited people from churches all over the country to come and join him. And a combination of the different churches here in Davis got together. And um, uh, we arranged a full bus load from Davis to go down there. Um, it was an incredible experience, uh, the, the, the contrast we saw between the reception we got from our black, black brothers and sisters in, in, uh, in Montgomery was just so, that was just so wonderful to us. How many people went from Davis? I think Davis? about 34, about 34 altogether, yeah. And yet, uh, and then we, when we saw the way we were treated, uh, by the white people that were standing on the sidewalk, spitting in the face of the, uh, of the preacher of our church here in Davis, the community church at that time. Uh, it was an amazing experience. So not only were black people treated poorly, but those white people who were the sympathizers with them were also treated poorly. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Reverend yes, Lawson. When, when, when people went down to respond to Martin's call, the only safe place was in that black community. Once you got down there, you better be sure you were in that, that uh, community. The interesting thing is that even those who went down on the buses from all over the country, their eyes were open too because they never ever dreamed they would run into such spontaneous hospitality some would say if it were reversed, I'm not too sure whether we would open up our community, our beds, our food and all, as eagerly as they're doing now. The uh, overall thrust of the people going into the South upon the invitation of Martin was a penetrating uh, confrontation to the South itself because those people who went in were going in integrated. They were blacks and whites and everybody going in. Although where we were going, it was separated and segregated and all. But the people it, coming in. They gave the community, people who were in opposition to us, a chance to see that white and black and other nationalities could actually live together as human beings, this was the first kind of confrontation to tell them it can work 
if you understand what we're yeah. trying to do. Yeah. Your point about how much better you felt when you were around black people <laughs> in the South is so well taken. I mean, I, I wasn't at all uncomfortable at all in that situation, but I was dead uncomfortable when I was out of the range of the black community. Yeah. When I was down because there. you saw the hostility. Because all the hostility where, where I went. And, and of course, we were sort of prepared for it. We, we read about it and we saw what was going on on television. But I, the, the one point that I would like to really make is that we had to do some soul searching when we came back. We were only there a, yeah. a very, very short time. Yeah. We were welcomed in and they, we were, were welcomed out so they didn't have to keep track and take care of us like they had to. So we came back pretty quickly. But on the way back, we got to think about what was going on in California. Was it really different from California? And it was different, certainly, but there was a lot of problems in Davis and throughout California. When you shared with me, Dick, uh, that shock, that surprise, the contrast when you came back to California, back to our community of yeah. Davis at the time, it was such a stark contrast uh, well, excuse me, stark contrast, but there was a lot of similarities. And you shared with me some of the discriminatory practices mm -hmm. that our own town had at that well, time. Let me just briefly mention three things I think might be useful. Almost every piece of property in Davis had a restrictive covenant saying that you could not sell to, to Jews, uh, 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 African American people, or Mexican American. That was on the restrictive covenant on the property that you bought in Davis. The piece of property that I owned on K Street, which was just built, uh, was three years old at that time, had it on it, as did other properties here in town. Now, I, it, I must say, though, in those days, the Byron Rumford Fair Housing Act had passed, but most people didn't know that. They just saw that piece of paper and felt that they weren't able to sell it, which legally they, they were not allowed to discriminate, but it was happening all the time. So. That was true, and as far as rentals were concerned, many black students that came to Davis, as there were more coming in those days, uh, found that they couldn't find an apartment to rent in Davis. So we had to go to the apartments and ask for a, a, an apartment as a white person, and they would say, well, we've got three apartments. And we said, well, let me just go tell my cousin that you've got them. <laughs> and your cousin happened to be black, and you brought him in, and you got him an apartment. So Here's that, my black cousin. Yeah, I want to get right. an apartment for him. Yeah, it, it was uh, a heart-searching experience for many people because no matter how eager they were to answer the call of Martin, as you have said very clearly, it's easier to go in and come out. The, the problem is, although we, we had the people coming in to help us, it is different if you have to live in that situation day by day. Yeah. You can easy, easily go back home and business as usual, search your heart and all. We found out under the leadership of Martin that the people not only came briefly and shortly, some of them they came, finally made the, the plunge into dedication to take their gifts back into the South to help us in the struggle. Right. We needed all kind of gifts to do it, but if you went in for a few days and, and left, that meant the gifts of organization and legal counsel and everything would go back into the buses home. So our challenge was to get people to commit larger time under the peril and the danger of their life so that we could really, really help the people down in the South galvanize. How, how did they do that? What were some examples uh, of what yeah, different well, people and organizations yeah, did? We, yeah, that's right. It was through several kind of organizations, and we had people who were skilled enough to take the people who were coming down and to do a whole lot of things. One was to train them how to survive if they were attacked, how to uh, practice now violence, to screen them to find out what uh, skills they had and tell them what slots they could fit in mm -hmm. to help us. One, one of the greatest contributions that happened uh, was on the level of the presence of the college students because they brought all kinds of skills in terms of all including 
the skill of investigating, you know, when you're dealing with problems and all, and writing up significantly and intelligently the reports and all like that, we could not, could not have half survived if we had not had those talents committed a long enough to stay to help us. Are you talking about the Student Nonviolent yeah. Coordinating Committee? The SNCC. other group, see. That yeah. was a wonderful thing. And we had a number of students the year before that went down on the Mississippi Freedom uh, March, is that? That went down for registering voters in, in, uh, yes. in Mississippi through the, the Davis's um, Cal Aggie Christian Association. We had a whole bunch of that that first summer. And the group was called SNCC. What did that stand for again? Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Okay. okay. That was wonderful that, that so many kids. But you know, don't you think that there were still a lot, number of, of, of uh, very brave, courageous white people in the South, too, that, that supported Yeah, when they, when they uh, actually they were, made the committee. Some, amazing, some didn't yeah. come down the state. No. But they were really... Oh yes, we couldn't have done it without the presence in the marches yeah. or in, in, in the inside of the area. Uh, there is a kind of uh, bravery and courage if it's awakened, even though they knew there was danger all the time down there. They risked their lives in such a way that and stayed long enough to build to build a force that did not cave in. The the problem with the beginning of the thing was, all they didn't, they knew it was dangerous. When they start killing people, our job was how on earth are you going to keep those people down there when they see the high price is death? So when the three civil rights uh, leaders disappeared and got killed, hundreds and thousands of them flew down. Not only we we flew down to stabilize those. Coval stations where the people were working, and to prove by our presence that we were not going to let death, the threat of death, drive us out. If if we were there to put our warm bodies on the line, we felt that it probably would influence them to stay, and it worked because some of them, when those three uh, persons disappeared, we knew they were killed, and it's these. These students started packing to leave. It's one thing to work in danger, but when you start losing troops, so we we finally reached effectively the level where we had enough of them to stay, like you say, to lay down their lives to, to participate. Dick, when you came back to Davis, um, were you and the group of thirty-five other people that that went on that bus? Were you? How were you treated when you returned? Um, right. Did people treat you differently? Well, I had lots of friends who yeah. had similar uh, 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 political social feelings that okay. I had, and so uh, I was welcomed back. And I've I've always been part of a music community of <laughs> Davis, and we learned how to sing those wonderful uh, freedom songs, <laughs> and we would sing those and think, yeah. and, and have lots of uh, uh, fun doing that. But uh, I will say that the pastor of the community church suffered a great deal. A number of people re resigned from his oh, church yeah, they lost in, here in Davis. Uh, um, and it was it was a very sad period of time. And uh, the pastor of the Methodist church uh, was felt uncomfortable there, too. Several people moved out. A couple, It started with another couple of churches whose names I will not mention <laughs> at the moment, uh, that, where people went after they left the churches that were very actively involved in that period. But um, I think Davis, you know, it's a, this is a university community and I think people are educated and intelligent enough to realize that, that that was not right. And we were able to make some amazingly good correctional things that happened there. I, I'm really curious to know what you think, Reverend. Uh, every once in a while I say, well, we take one step forward, but we seem to take two steps back. And I just don't know whether we're really I can see that there has been some wonderful changes in the past. Now we're coming up to, to now, and sometimes I'm wondering if we're not, you know, if we're not careful, we don't work hard to hang on to these things that we've accomplished if we slide back. And Reverend, before you answer that question, my apologies. I wanted to let our audience <laughs> know. I, 
I introduced the Reverend Lawson, and I didn't tell you who exactly he is. The Reverend Lawson <laughs> was a friend, was a friend and colleague of the Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, he knew Dr. King since um, he was what? Did you say Six, 16, 16 years 16 old? Years of age. <laughs> so we have a legend here in our presence. Not only was he involved, but he knew him very intimately. He knew him very closely. Good friends with him. Um, so back to Dick Holstock's question. Well, one of the, how, how have one we of the deepest insights in our struggle was to reckon with the fact that the oppressor is never going to give up. Never. No oppressing group ever intelligently gives people freedom. We found out if you ever going to be free, it has to be, come from our posture and not because the oppressor gives it to you. So there's a lot of danger and peril because when the pressure increases on the part of the opponent, you don't know what's going to happen to people who are trying to help us, and they can easily get discouraged, the best of them. It is not easy to, to work in the midst of danger productively and faithfully with deep commitment. It's so easy to get out of it if it gets too tough. So some people left. It's just that dangerous. Martin King brought to the forefront endurance stick to itiveness, passive resistance, no retreat. Even in all of his uh, marches and all, he never entertained retreat. So even though some people lost courage and hope, he was always there. Mark was going to any kind of danger. So he had a group to keep stimulating. We had enough people to believe in his leadership that filled the vacancies when people would leave. It, it, it became so adventuresome and right what we were doing that it mushroomed. People kept coming. It did not reduce, although they were going forward and going back. The, the discriminatory practices in the South were so infrastructured, and so institutionalized, you know, into the, mm -hmm. it's hard to destroy conditioned racism. So you're always going to have a struggle. If you don't if you don't reckon with the fact that it's going to be a tough fight, you're never going to get in it. You're never going to give it, give up easily. Never. You were on that bus trip. You came back. You've seen all these changes over the years. And, you know, there have been many changes, many advances. Now, though, we're in the year 2004, where we have a president with uh, some very independent um, ideas. He seems to be marching to his own drum, um, spending billions of dollars on a war uh, where other countries don't want to join him. Um, it's affecting our economy. It, it just, health care is, is outrageous and inaccessible to many people. Are we... I, I, looked at, I look at Dr. King's speeches and so many speeches that he gave about Vietnam. You could replace Vietnam in those speeches and put Iraq, and the same holds true nowadays. It, are we making progress? Do you feel we are? Have we taken some steps back? Well, we need to listen to what Dr. King said and, and recognize that, that, that we are steering away from the path that he provided for us to go on. And I. Uh, I, I, for one, would want to do what work I can. And I really feel, like the Reverend was saying, you know, it gets tiring after so many years. Mm -hmm. You keep on trying to, to do stuff. And, and I'm, I'm frankly, I'm, I'm tired of having to redeal with those same kinds of issues all over again. But we can't afford to let go. We've got to keep on working. We've got to do what we can to stop this. When I, when I went and marched this year, uh, in San Francisco, uh, it, that that march, I've never, it, I've never been in any march. I've been in lots of marches in my life, but I've never been in any march that that resembled the numbers of people that were opposed to the war. When we tried to, we we couldn't even get started because there were so, so many, many people. people. We hmm. stood there for hours waiting to get started.
because the, the end of the line was at the end of the, was where the, where the rally was taken, that was two miles away. And we had solid packed people coming from every direction. And it was never covered properly in the press, as so many things were yeah. never covered properly in the press in, in your time. So the, the, the leadership of King does not rest on immediate victories. No. He's, he is a hard <laughs> leader to follow because he can see the obstacles, but he can see way beyond all of the obstacles. If, if, you, if you study uh, Martin Luther King's uh, speeches and all, he talks about a future that will become a reality. No matter how many times it goes backwards and forwards and people fall out and use the wrong methodology and all, <laughs> he had such profound faith in the reality that that kind of future that talks about the whole family of brothers and sisters, including the people who are now opponents, who are now opponents. I don't know too many people who had that long range uh, view of Martin King. For instance, the night before he died, he said, I may not get to the promised land, but we as a people, well, what, watch this, we as a people would get to the promised land. Some people think in terms of he's only talking about the black people. But if you read the end of his speech, I have a dream. It's for all. He talks about yeah, the slave yeah. master children and all. Yeah. And then he, he, he did a geographical flight on us. He took us from New Hampshire <laughs> down across Pennsylvania to California, mm -hmm. came back to Stonehill in Georgia. What he was saying was, when all that happens, what's that future? When that happens, then we can say, Thank God Almighty, we free it. The, free, <laughs> the freedom he was talking about was not before it happened, which was tied with the future. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for saying that. that. It makes you, you feel better when you, yeah, we, we can't let up, can we? We can't give up. We can't. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Please do. Please okay. do ask a question. Okay, you're five years older than Martin Luther King, right? You're you, five, you were five years you're five older. You're five years older than Dr. King was. No, I'm older than that. Yeah. He was it was ten, I'm about ten, nine, nine years old. Okay. Nine. Well, you knew him from when he was 16. But yet you talk of him as your leader. Well, at what point did you really find, figure out this guy had the gift that it was going to take? Okay. To, to lead I'm, I'm, the I'm not only, I'm also a preacher. Yeah. So that Martin and I, like others, are trained theologically. Yeah. So that... Uh, so that our roots, the root system is really biblical. What Martin did was he did not spend all of his time pulpit preaching, explaining the theology. He did a marvelous thing by living it out. He didn't, he didn't get in the pulpit and keep talking about all his Bible stuff. He knew from the base of the Bible that his his calling was on the level of helpfulness, service, rather than the theology. The theology was just the inspiration for him to go. You cannot really read the Bible unless you know you've got to be a servant in the midst of people. His, the emphasis is his practical experience over against the background of the theology. He didn't carry the Bible, he carried out what the Bible said. You understand? Yeah. He took off the preacher's robe and he got down where the people were and lifted them. Did, did he have that when you first knew him? When you knew him? Well, he was in one? college training then, you know. Well, he was precocious, but nobody, nobody ever dreamed, you know, that he even be... when he went to Montgomery. Nobody ever dreamed the escalation of his effectiveness well, again, you would civil rights. No, well, we didn't. Well, that. he was a big follower of Gandhi, right? He was a very big follower of Gandhi. I remember yeah. you shared oh, yeah. that with us that before. Was, that was a part of his methodology and approach to all this in the Western world. The nonviolence. Not, yeah. Uh, civil disobedience. See, it's not enough to criticize and stand against what's injuring you. 
you have to find out now how to move <laughs> to, that it was causing the injury. Yeah. So that what he did, what he, he, he went to India, but Gandhi was dead then, but he studied under Nehru. And he found out that the only way to really come alive as a warrior against evil is you not only got to believe it, but you got to really do it. The way you do it is, it's dangerous. The way you do it is don't take any more from the enemy. You keep him on his toes and you keep reminding him it's wrong. Even if you got to die, you do not compromise with him anymore. So that what King did, King got on that line and never retreated. You could hit him, spit, threaten his life, blow up the churches and all. He kept marching. The, 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 what's tough about King is he has no space to retreat. All right, so if anybody goes into the civil rights movement, he knows that he may get killed. If you settle that, then you can be a good warrior because most of them are not going to get killed. Thank you so much. It's been an honor speaking yeah. with you both about this. I'm sure we could, we could have a show for two, three, four hours just talking about this. Um, that about wraps up our show, but you can hear more of Dick Holstock tomorrow. He's going to be playing at the uh, the Martin Luther King celebration. Good. Yeah, with the Freedom Singers yeah. up tomorrow at the at the Martin Luther King celebration over at the Varsity Theater at 12 noon. And the Reverend Earl W. Lawson is going to be our honorary guest speaker and. Uh, you will be able to hear his profound message that we've all been honored to wait listen to, to. We can hardly <laughs> wait to hear. And thank you all for joining us. And please be sure to stay tuned so you can watch the wonderful documentary this evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. I wasn't going to take it from you. I'm not going to take it.